Amen. Bow heads and we say Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship and now to go. Bless us, Lord God, by your Spirit. Mold us and shape us into the people that you would have us be. For Jesus' sake. <coughs> my brothers, my sisters, we've been talking about habits, the spiritual power of habits. And last week we talked about grammar. Great present tense, which has the idea of keep on doing this thing. Don't just do it once, but keep on over and over and over again. And the New Testament is filled with encouragements for habit forming. Living our faith in Christ. And today and the next few weeks, we're going to talk about some things that, that maybe help us understand habits in our lives. And things that we should be changing or altering or looking at, at least, in our walk with Christ. I'm not talking about sin. Sin, obviously, is never going to be a good thing, and it's always going to interfere with our walk with Christ, and it's always going to be a problem, and that's something we should always cut out of our lives, and there should never be an excuse for that, right? That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about things that in and of themselves are not sinful, but might interfere with living the faith that God would have us live. You're following me? All right, so for instance, I had, I'm going to talk a lot about gardening today, so I had a garden in Antigua. I love having a garden, but Antigua is very dry, and if you're not constantly watering your plants, they will never flourish. You couple that with a dog who likes to eat green tomatoes, <laughs> and dig in your garden because it was nice soil to dig in. And it was just a source of what? Frustration. Frustration. <laughs> I'd come out and, oh, my tomatoes are starting to get nice and full. And I'd come out, and they're all gone because the dog chewed them all up. Ah. Or I'd get busy, and I wouldn't be able to go out and water for three days. I'd go out there, and all my lettuce looks like it, it was, you know, nurse it back to health just in time for me to get busy again and stop watering it for a couple of days. I said, why in the world? And am I doing this because all it does is lead me to be angry and to be frustrated. And so I stop growing a garden. Growing a garden in and of itself is not wrong. But the thing that the garden did for me was not healthy. In my trust in Jesus Christ, in my walk with him, in the way that I interacted with my dog and my family. All right? You with me? Today we're going to talk about guarding our hearts. Solomon is writing in Proverbs to his son. His son is going to take over and be king someday. He writes down a bunch of things in Proverbs, wisdom. And this section here kind of gets very personal. I want you to imagine Solomon talking to his son or writing this down and thinking of his son as he says these words. And he's going to use the phrase, guard your heart. <laughs> But before that, he tells us why it's so important to guard our hearts, right? This is what he says. <clears throat> my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. In your gaze, you know, fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Guard your heart. <coughs> Guard it, he says, because these things, right? He says they are the life. They are life for those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Life. Health 
not just physical health, but your whole being is better if you follow the, these words that I'm about to share with you. Guard your heart because out of it flows all sorts of things. The wellspring of what? Out of it flows everything that you do from your heart. Guard it. Picture there is a military term. This is the first the soldier who's at the gate. He's got his sword. He's got his spear. And he's not so much making uh, watching who's going out, but he's more what? Watching who's coming in and making sure that those who are coming in are what? Good for the city. Going to promote peace. These are going to not be problem so, uh, people causing problems. This is not going to be an issue. If you're going to cause an issue, if you're going to do something that isn't right, what is the soldier supposed to do? Turn you away. Stop you from coming in. Guard your heart. Set up a wall. Set up a boundary. Set up a, a soldier at the gate so that the things that get into your heart are only those things that are going to be good, right, positive. Promote your well-being. The truth is, sometimes we get into bad habits where we allow things into our lives and into our hearts that are that do not promote peace, that do not promote our well-being. We fool ourselves if we think that the things that we see and the things that we hear and the things that we allow our mind to dwell on don't really affect us. It's not true. The places that we go, the people that we hang out with, the music that we listen to on the radio, the things we watch on TV, the conversations that we have, the things that we read, all of it, all of it gets in and it affects us. And sometimes we say, well, I'm a good, solid Christian, and those things aren't going to what? <clears throat> Fooling ourselves if we think that those things don't make a difference because they do. <clears throat> they affect our hearts. They affect our inner selves. And the more that we allow those things in, the more it begins to change who we are. And the more it begins to affect our hearts. Sometimes we get into habits where we allow these things in. We allow ourselves to dwell on these things and live in these things. And then it should not surprise us that our walk in Christ is not what it's supposed to be. Even worse, it has the potential to totally, totally lead us down a very wrong path. You've seen that before, right? What things in your lives interfere in your walk with Christ. The truth is, this whole thing, God has a plan for you, and he has a life that he would want you to live, and we're going to talk about that next time. The, the, the Christian, the life that God has intended for you. We don't always flourish in this life because we have these things that prevent us from growing. Garden illustration. If we think of our faith, as a plant that is growing, that needs to be nurtured, that needs the right soil and the right water, the right light, the right this, the right that, right? But then we put a bunch of poison in there. What? It's not going to work. My father, where he lives, and my mother, they both live there, the soil there is horrible. It's, it used to be a pine forest, and pine trees do not make for good soil for gardening, for lettuce and tomatoes and things like that. But he's worked hard at making the soil better. He buries fish stuffed in there and camel scraps and they burn their garbage. He puts all the burn in there and everything. The soil is getting better. But the problem is that once a year, at least once a year, twice a year, the whole yard floods. Now there's nothing wrong with the flooding. Usually flooding isn't a bad thing. It leaves lots of sediment behind and things like that. But the problem is that the flooding that occurs is salt water. <laughs> so no matter how hard my dad works on making his soil better, he's always going to have trouble because the flooding comes and leaves, it leaves a residue of salt that's going to interfere with his flourishing, with the fruit that his garden will produce. What things flood into your heart, into your life, that leave a residue that keeps you from growing in your faith in Jesus Christ? <coughs> Patterns, what habits, what things are coming in, leaving behind.
behind something that it does not promote the well-being, the spiritual well-being that God intends for us to have. Since we're talking about gardening so much, can't help but think of the fruits of the Spirit. Our faith in Jesus Christ comes from the Spirit being in us, and the Spirit being in us produces fruit in our lives. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What things in your life are preventing you from producing the fruit that God intends for you to produce? What things are leaving a residue in your life that make it hard for you to produce love, to produce joy, to produce peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Sometimes we get so caught up in our schedule and we do the same thing over and over and over again and we don't even realize that there are things, there are people, there are seemingly good things even that keep us from producing the fruit that God intends for us to produce. I was talking to a young man and uh, about his girlfriend. He loved his girlfriend. They had a great time together. Uh, she made him laugh. Uh, it was great. But after a while, he began to realize that she had a very, very miserable, negative spirit. And he tried hard to lift her up and to change her, her attitude and to change her outlook on life. But she just talked about how awful this world was and how terrible everything was and how, how awful she was even. He began to realize that her, her attitude and her spirit was bringing him down. He could not be the child of God that he knew that he could be, that he should be. And he could not produce in his life the love joy, the peace, the patience, and he broke up with it. Things, people, jobs, neighbors, hobbies, TV shows, websites, things that do not help us produce the fruit that God intends for us to have. Step away from them. Even though they may not in and of themselves be sinful, if they interfere with our walk with Christ, it's a habit that we should probably break. During the pandemic, I was talking to a couple who was just overwhelmed by all of the stress that was being caused. And they said, Pastor, we didn't know what to do. It was so horrible so overwhelming we stopped watching the news she said I love the news my favorite thing to do is get up in the morning and read the but I could not I was having trouble trusting that God was going to take care of all this that God was in control of all things so I had to cut out the what things in your life are leaving a residue making it hard for you to produce the fruit that God intends for you to produce in your life. Back to Philippians, which we read earlier. Notice what Paul writes. Philippians 4. You look at verse 7 with me, page 6 of the program there. The truth is that we cannot cut everything out of our life that causes stress. We cannot cut everything out of our life that causes problems. There are certain things in our lives that God has placed in front of us, and even though it might challenge us to produce and to be the child of God that God would have us be, 
God put those there and we can't cut those out. I don't care how much stress your children put on you. Guess what? <laughs> you don't get to run away. <coughs> you understand? There are certain things. I don't care how much how, how stressful the doctor's news was. <coughs> it's still your news and your health and your body. There are certain things that we cannot cut out of our lives. And that's where this verse in Philippians comes in. Verse 7 says this. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will, it's a promise, see it? Will guard <coughs> hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, the things that I can maybe cut out, the things that I do need to change, the things that I do need to minimize because it's interfering with my joy, my happiness, my peace in Jesus Christ. Maybe I need to change those habits. But the things that I cannot, I take them to the peace of Jesus, to the cross of Jesus, to the promise that God has made that he will take care of all things, that he has forgiven my sins and I don't need to worry about my eternity I don't need to worry about my future. I don't need to worry about my standing before the Lord God. I don't need to worry about whether or not I'm good enough because I know Christ has died for me. I don't even need to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow or in this situation over here because I know that I am loved by God. I am at peace with God. And that will guard my heart from, what, from all the things that want to destroy it. The things that we cannot control, we take to the cross of Christ, we take to the Piece of, that he won for us on that cross. We douse it. We douse it. The peace that Jesus won. The blood of Jesus Christ. So that these things that we, that rob us of the joy and steal away our peace and keep us from, from, from the love that God would have us have for one another, pour enough peace of Christ on it to put it out so that it no longer robs us of those things. Are you with me? Does that make sense? I feel like I talked in a circle. <laughs> Maybe I did. But the things in my life that keep me from being what God would have me be, to cut those away. The things that I can't bring to Jesus Christ and the peace that he has won, and find their peace answers and comfort and strength to deal with those that I cannot be. Guard your hearts. Guard it by only letting the right things in. Guard it by covering it with the peace that Jesus won on the cross. Amen? Let's stand and join together in our next song. It is, it is as well with my soul. <coughs>